and it is the 27 book in the New Testament. And the Lord wants us to really understand this book. He wants us to read this book. He wants us to study this book. And in so doing, he, he told us that if we were to read the book, he's going to give us a blessing. He's going to bless us. He said that if we were to hear the book, we are going to get a blessing. And he, he also said that if we keep the book, we are going to get a blessing. The book starts off with a blessing. The book ends with a blessing. That says, blessed is he who keep the sayings of this prophecy for the time is at hand. We also said that the book of Revelation is the only book that... Uh, has its own outline. Jesus said, write the things which thou hast seen, write the things which are, and write the things which shall be hereafter. And that is the outline that we are following. The things which thou hast seen is Revelation chapter one. And for those of you who came in late, I want to show you a little of what we did in Revelation chapter one. John said, and I saw seven golden candlesticks. It is not a candlestick that we know of. It is a seven sprung candlestick with seven wicks, seven lights. And you can see a picture here of the priests ministering in the, in the tabernacle or in the temple. And um, this, is, this is what John saw. He saw seven of these. This here is a close-up of what the candlestick looked like in the Jewish uh, faith. It is called a menorah. And there are different types of menorah. There's one that they use for Hanukkah. I think it has uh, nine, nine days, uh, nine lights in it. It's different from this one. So this is what John saw. He saw uh, seven golden candlesticks. So this is more or less what John would have seen. You will see the seven candlesticks around here. And he said, one like unto the son of man, clothed with garment down to his foot, seven stars in his right hand, a sword uh, proceeding out of his mouth. When John saw that, John fell on his face as though he was dead. And I believe that this is why God had to send an angel to share with John, because every time John saw the glorified Christ, he will fall on the ground. So that's causing him not to get the revelation. So the Lord sent an angel and uh, to testify onto the things that he wanted us to hear. This is a clearer picture of what Revelation chapter one is like. You will see the seven golden candlesticks. And let me... All right, give me a second. All right, here we go. These are the seven golden candlesticks. And you have them throughout, throughout this area. You have one like unto the son of man in the midst. And you saw you would see the sword in his mouth. And there are seven stars in his right hand. Today, I want you to concentrate on the seven stars in his right hand. Uh, these seven candlesticks, it is said that each candlestick represent a church. So candlestick number one represent the church at Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira. This is the four churches that we did already. Today we will be doing the church at Sardis. Now the seven stars that is in his right hand are the seven angels of these seven churches. These seven churches have what we call seven angels, and we will be dealing with that a little later. But this is the slide that we use for Revelation chapter one. So those of you who miss it, this is what we were looking at in Revelation chapter one. This is what John saw. 
in Revelation chapter one. Each candlestick represents a church. Each church represents a period in time in church history. And today, all these churches exist together. And you or any church on the face of the earth will fall onto, under one of these churches that uh, we are seeing here. So as we go along, these churches also represent each individual Christian. You would have the traits of the characteristics of one of, or two or three or four of these churches. You might be in a condition of these churches and the Lord it will give you a remedy for your problem. So let's continue. Um, Revelation chapter three. This is the beginning of Revelation chapter three. We finished with Revelation chapter two last week. We dealt with the four churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, and Tyra. Today we are dealing with the church at Sardis. The church address on, onto the angel of the church in Sardis writes. So let us talk a little again about the angels of the church in, uh, in, in Sardis. Onto the angel, onto the angel, the seven stars that you, uh, you see in the right hand is the seven angels of the seven churches. Now, let me, let me go to the next slide and I will clear this up. Give me a sec. Here we go. All right, now let me wait on that. All right, this, uh, onto, this, uh, onto the angel. The angel of the church is in the hand of Christ and they are represented by a star. So what does this mean? John was told to write unto the angel of the church of Sardis and send them a letter. Now there is no postman working from earth to heaven. So the angel that the Lord is talking about of the church of Sardis is the pastor or the bishop of the church in Sardis. So what does this tell us? This tells us that your pastor, we have two pastors in our midst today, Pastor Michael and Pastor Roland, they are represented by stars in the right hand of Jesus. They are held in the right hand of Jesus Christ. They are also known as angels. These pastors, and those of you who are striving to be pastors, you are a star in the hand of Jesus, and you are an angel as far as Jesus is concerned. So, with that being said, in the church of Ephesus, we had Timothy. He was the bishop at that time. He was the, the angel. He was the star. In Smyrna, we had Polycrap. He was, he was the bishop and, and or the pastor. In Pergamos, we had an, uh, Antipas, but he died three years before the letters came. So, but he was the bishop. He was the pastor. He was the star. Now in Thyatira, I couldn't find who the pastor was at that time. In Sardis is Mileto of Sardis. He was the pastor of the time of this writing. So when Jesus talked about unto the angel of the church, He's talking about the pastor or the bishop of the church. And I said, your pastor, pastors of all the churches are in the right hand of, God, of Jesus. And they are stars and they are angels as far as God is concerned. Now, let us talk about Sardis for a minute. The only church that we had uh, uh, really good information on was the church of Ephesus. We saw the very inception of the church. We saw the ministers in the church. We saw the church grow. We saw the church develop. And that was the only church we had that information on. The other church we had a little information on was Thyatira. And we, we know about Thyatira from Lydia. Now, Sardis, the church Sardis was first mentioned only in Revelation chapter 1. That's the only place Sardis was mentioned. There was no information on the church at Sardis. However, 
We have information on the city of Sardis. Sardis was the capital city of Lydia. Lydia was the, king, the kingdom of Lydia. And Sardis was the capital. In Sardis, there were two regions in this city. There was a lower region and an upper region. The lower region was where the four people lived, which was close to the river. I don't understand how they were the four people or why they should have been the four people because they discovered gold and silver along the river. The upper region was between 800 and 1500 feet high and they were surrounded by tree cliffs and there was only one entrance. And this is important to know because you will understand the message that Jesus was sending. The upper region of the city was surrounded by three major cliffs. There was no way you could scale the walls uh, or the walls of the cliff. It was between 800 and 1500 feet high. And there, there were also internal walls around the city. Now they were rich because I said they discovered gold and silver. They sold dye and wool and fruits. And they were the first people to use coins. They were the first nation to use coinage. They used gold coins and they used silver coins. And when, when Cyrus the Great, uh, the city was captured by Cyrus the Great in 549. When Cyrus the Great, the Great captured the city of Sardis, it is said that he looted the city of $600 million worth of wealth. $600 million worth of wealth, the city of Sardis, or the capital city of Sardis. And it is very interesting to know how the city was captured. Remember, uh, the, the, the upper region had three cliffs surrounding the city, and there was only one entrance. So during the time of war, Cyrus the Great, who was the same Cyrus from the Medes and the Persians, who who defeated Babylon. So it was the same Cyrus who sent back the children of Israel to build a, the, the walls in Jerusalem and the temple in Jerusalem. And he had a campaign against Sardis. And when he moved into Sardis, uh, the, the, the king, which is Crossus, Kros he moved his, his army from the lower region onto the upper region. And this is important. I know it might be boring, but this is important to know because you will see what the message is all about as we go along. Now, because the city was supposed to be impregnable, the, the people felt very safe there. So Cyrus the Great told his people that uh, his, his, his soldiers, he said, if anybody would find a way into the city of Sardis, I will give you a very big bonus. So one evening, the soldiers were looking at their enemy, which is in Sardis, and they saw a soldier drop his, his helmet. And a short while after, they saw the helmet disappear from the ground and was back on the soldier's head. So then they realize that there is a secret passage to get into the city behind the walls. So he, a group of men, his men, they form again, again and they went during the night and they found that secret passage and they went into the city of Sardis. They found everybody sleeping, all the soldiers who should have been guarding the city they were sleeping and they captured the city that night. So instead of watching, instead of paying attention, instead of guarding the city, they were asleep because they were so sure that they were safe. Hmm. Now this happened in 549 BC. Now 300 years later, around 218 BC, it happened again, the exact same scenario. The soldiers were sleeping and the enemy went through the secret entrance and they captured the city. So twice that happened. Let's continue. These things said he that had the seven spirits of God. So 
so we don't have a, a we don't have anything on the church of Sardis, but we have on the city of Sardis. And remember how the city fell. These things said he that had the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, the first time we saw the term, the seven spirits of God, was in Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. Uh, John was pronouncing his salutation on the church. And he said, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. That's the first time we saw the term, the seven spirits in the book of Revelation. And now this is the second time we are seeing the seven spirits of God. Let's continue. Revelation chapter 4 verse 5. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of God. So the position of the spirit, the, the, the seven spirit or the spirit of God is before the throne. Now we see a little more information. There are seven lamps of fire burning. So the spirit which is before the throne is in the form of lamps of fire burning before the throne. Let's continue. And in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it has been slain having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the world, on, into all the earth. So here we see another picture of the seven spirits of God. And this is seven eyes that is upon the Lamb in Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. So we see three pictures of the seven spirits of God. So the question is, are there seven spirits? Are there seven Holy Spirits? John said, John said, and I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. That is John chapter 1, verse 32. So is, is, does, is one of the spirits of God a dove? Or do we have seven spirits? Or do we have one Holy Spirit? Let's continue. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. This is the sevenfold work of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. It's the spirit of Yahweh. That is one. And then we have the spirit of the fear of Yahweh. yod heh vav -He. And we have the spirit of strength. We have the spirit of understanding. We have the spirit of wisdom. The spirit of counsel. And the spirit of knowledge. Now pay attention to the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of knowledge. But all of this here, the seven-fold work of the Holy Spirit, but one spirit. Let us continue. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. For by one spirit, one spirit, one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. I would recommend you read um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 up to verse 14 or 15, and you will see this a little clearer. For to one is given by the Spirit, the word of wisdom that I circled in the previous slide, and to another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. So it's one Spirit, but you have two functions, the word of wisdom, and you have the word of knowledge, but the same spirit. There are different gifts, but the same spirit. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. So for your assignment, you can read First Corinthians chapter 12, first verses 1 through 13 or 14, and you will get the picture that there are more than 2,000 references of one spirit, but sevenfold working of the same one spirit. Let's continue. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest, and that dead. Now, at this point, you're supposed to say, ouch. Jesus just went straight out. I know thy works. You have a name that you liveth, and you are dead. We will get to that in a minute. 
I know thy works. And then in Revelation chapter 3, verse 2, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. So if you were to combine this, I know thy works. I have not found thy work perfect before God. Let's go. What was going on in the church at this time? Now remember, when John was writing, he was seen ahead. He was seen ahead into the churches. He was seen ahead into the, the condition of the church, as we would say. Now that we are studying the book of Revelation, we are looking backwards into history of the churches. So what was going on at that time? In order to understand what was going on at that time, we have to understand how the church departed from its original setting. The original setting was in Jerusalem when uh, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell and 3,000 souls were saved. And then later on, 5,000 souls were saved. All these were Jewish people. They understand the Tanakh. They understand the Torah. And these are the people that were saved. Then we started, we, we continue with Cornelius. And then we continue with Paul, who was the, the, the apostle to the Gentiles. And then the Lord allowed the Gentiles to, to become part of the church. And in so doing, um, we have the church of Ephesus. They left their first love. We have the church at Smyrna. They were the persecuted church. That was the time when the church had 10 different waves of persecution. Jesus found nothing wrong with those, those churches because they were perfect. Then we went on to the church of Pergamos. And this is where the devil changed his strategy that Jesus had to go back to the Old Testament and, and use the example of Balaam and Balak to explain to us what was happening in the churches. So the devil changed his plan from persecuting the church to embracing the church under Constantine. Now, what I am doing here is giving you a history of what we did, bringing you up to this point in Sardis. So the church now has become diluted. The church has become a state religion. So the church was no longer controlled in Jerusalem. The control center of the church was in Rome. When the church was con con controlled from Rome, they started changing things. They started changing Passover and celebrating Easter. They started, they added Christmas and things like that. And that is where it started because the church was controlled in Rome. And then we went on to the church of Tyre, where they included that woman Jezebel. And by the way, that woman Jezebel, her spirit is still here today and she is still functioning in in the world. So then we get to Sardis. Now, at this point in Sardis, the church was selling um, indulgence, indulgence, indulgence. And that is where they invented purgatory. And they said that if you were a good person and you, you could not go to hell because you was a good person, but you were not good enough to go to heaven. So you have to spend time in purgatory until you have enough works accumulated or somebody bail you out of purgatory or they buy your salvation and you can go to heaven. So this, is, this was the condition of the church at that time. This was the general condition of the church and it was controlled by Rome. Now the church was very rich. It owned one third of all the land in Europe. The church was full of artifacts, uh, bones of saints, uh, drops of blood, maybe the shawl, maybe, maybe pieces of the cross and things like that. The church was full of things like that. And Martin Luther in 1517, and by the way, the church of Sardis, they say started in 1517. He tried to broke, he didn't try to break away from the church. He tried to reform the church. He was a reformer and he tried to correct the things that he didn't agree with in the church. He said, you can't, you can't go on selling indulgence so, so that people will get out of hell. 
If you really love the people, you will empty hell, and, uh, the purgatory, and send everybody to heaven. But the, the, the priests, they were using this, this money to support their lifestyle. And Martin Luther, who was a young, the, at the beginning, he was a young lawyer until he came face to face with a storm one day and he made a promise to, to one of the, the saints that if she protect him, he will become a monk. And he, he did become a monk and he started to fight against the, the practices of the church. And then you have uh, Ziegler, you have Calvin, you have Knox, just to name a few. But these are not the only people who were reformers. This is just a few, starting from the year 1517 to 1550. Now, there were earlier reformers like John Wycliffe and John Huss. They were before Martin Luther. However, they considered the re uh, Reformation starting with Martin Luther. So what happened when all these guys they tried to break away from the church in Rome? This is what happened the people started to follow these leaders and you have the Lutheran church, you have Calvinism, uh, you have Hus, the, Hus, the Hus, Hussies, and then you have the Presbyterian, the Anglican, and you have names of, of, of denominations. And, G, and you gotta understand the church was considered dead. So when these guys started the reformation, they had a name that they were living. They had a name of being alive because the church was considered dead. The church in Rome was considered dead. So these guys were considered living. But what did Jesus say? Jesus said, you have a name that you live, but you are dead. So this is where this came from. And Jesus, you know, in, I, I will show you later where in every single church, Jesus knew exactly what was taking place. He said, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy work perfect be before God. Be watchful. Why would he say, be watchful? You remember what he said at, at, at Smyrna? He said, I will give you a crown of life. Why did he say that? Because the people in Smyrna they used to walk around with a crown on their head made out of flowers and vines. So he know they understood what it is to have a crown. So he said, hey, I will give you the crown of life. Remember what he said to Pergamum, Pergamos. I know where you live. I know where you dwell. I know your situation. What did he say to Tyra? These things said the son of God. Why did he say these things said the son of God? Because they were worshiping Apollo, who was the son of Zeus, and they considered him the son of God. Jesus said, no, I am the son of God. So Sardis, he said, be watchful. Why did he say be watchful? And then in uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 3, if therefore thou shalt not watch, he's encouraging them to watch. Why did he encourage them to watch? Because they fell asleep twice. The soldiers fell asleep twice and they lost the city. Jesus knew that. He knew that in 549 and 218, they fell asleep and they lost the city twice. So he said, be watchful. And if you do not watch, you're going to have a problem. And this is what I'm saying. The soldiers fell asleep twice and they were taken by the enemies. Now, let us compare these two churches. The church of Sardis and the church of Ephesus. Revelation chapter 3, verse 3. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. What did he say to Ephesus? Remember, therefore, from whence thou hast fallen and repent and do thy first works. Repeat thy first works. Repent and repeat thy first works. Let's continue. Remember how you, you received. Remember how you heard. Hold fast and repent. Remember from whence thou hast fallen. Repent and repeat. Do the first works. It is, it is so similar to these two churches. 
Now, there's one thing I, I forgot to mention. Jesus said, these things said he that had the seven spirits. The reason why he said these things that have the, said he that had the seven spirits is because the Reformation left out the Holy Spirit. The reason why they became a dead church is they did not have the Holy Spirit. This is why Jesus said, uh, these things said he that had the seven spirits of God, because they forgot about the Holy Spirit. So when you look at these two churches compared, you would see like Jesus is negotiating with them. Jesus is saying, come now, let us reason together, said the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be as red as crimson, they shall be as wool. He is reminding them, remember, remember how you received. Remember how you heard. Remember from whence you had fallen. Repent, hold fast. Repeat the same works, the, the, the works that you did at first. He is showing them their, their mistakes. He's showing them the remedy and, and what their rewards is going to be. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief. And thou shalt not know the hour I will come upon thee. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a, a thief. Be watchful. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come upon thee as a thief. First Thessalonians 5.2 for yourself know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Uh, Paul was talking to the Thessalonians. He said, but ye brethren are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. So Jesus coming as a thief to the dead church. Jesus is coming as a thief to the people who is in darkness. But because you that I'm speaking to today are children of the light, you are of the light, you are not in darkness, this day will not overtake you as a thief in the night. I would advise you to read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 through 10, and you will get the whole story. So the Lord is telling them, if you do not watch, I will come on thee as a thief. Now, remember when they were not watching, they were sleeping that night. The soldiers came in as a thief and he, they captured the city. So Jesus is using the things that they know to explain to them what is happening. Jesus is coming as a thief to the dead church or the sleeping church. Now look at Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garment, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Behold, I come as a thief. If you watch, you will keep your garment. You will not walk naked and they will not see your shame. Question. Is Jesus coming to thief their garment? Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed, he, uh, blessed is he that watch and keep his garment. Lest he walk naked. Is Jesus coming to steal his garment? Let's continue. This here is a thief. This is a thief in the night. This is a thief with a flashlight. Because he's a thief in the night. Is this how Jesus is going to be there? Is this how Jesus is coming? This is another picture of a thief. I can the place in the back is dark, the background is dark. This could be a thief in the night. Is Jesus gonna come like this guy? And I like this one. He don't look like it's it's, it's, it's night, but he's a, a thief. Is Jesus gonna come as that this that guy? No, he's not. The term a thief in the night is an idiom. An idiom in the Hebrew language. An idiom is an expression of a concept, feeling, idea, circumstance, or thing. An idiomatic expression should never be interpreted literally. 
So this is the first idiom I introduce you to in the Bible or in the book of Revelation. A thief in the night. It's a saying. It's an idiom. We have idioms in Trinidad. Let me give you some example of some idioms. The land, are flowing, the land is flowing with milk and honey. Come on, I'll take you to Cana. The land is flowing with milk and honey. Does that mean the rivers are flowing with milk and honey? No, it doesn't. It means the land is fertile. That is an idiom. Said in his heart, remember the, the prodigal son when he was eating the pig's food? He said in his heart, my father's house got so much food and so much servants. He, that means he thought to himself. So it's an idiom. When you read in the Bible, you can start looking for these idioms. Stiffen his neck means become stubborn. Found grace in, in the eyes. If you find grace in someone's eyes, it means you are accepted. Now, we have a few idioms also. Hit the ceiling is one. Be in hot water is another one. Throw in the towel is another one. So the term a thief in the night is an idiom. A thief in the night means a person or thing that moves in a swift and secretive, stealthy manner. This is how Jesus is going to come. Not those guys that I show you as thieves in the night. All right. A thief in the night. Let me show you how they got this. This is Leviticus chapter, chapter 6 verse 9. It is a burnt offering. Because of the burning upon the altar all night unto the morning and the fire of the altar shall be burning in it. We are talking about Leviticus chapter 6, verse 9. Uh, verse nine. Look at verse 13, and I would advise you to read Leviticus 6, verse, verses 8 to 13. And the fire shall be burning upon the altar, and it should never go out. This is the burnt offering we are talking about. So this is a picture of what the burnt offering is like. You would see the altar. You will see the sacrifice on the altar. You will see a priest attending to the fire. You see two guys here throwing slabs of meat onto the altar. And this is, this is actually how they did it because the heat is too much. So they have to throw the meat onto the altar. You see to the back here, you will see a big heap of ashes. Now, somebody have to tend to this fire. And this fire have to burn all night. This fire never goes out. And all the meat that is on this altar have to be burnt up. It have to be burnt up by daybreak or by morning or the time of the morning sacrifice. So the priest, would, the, the high priest or the captain of the temple would hire a priest to tend to this fire all night. Then something happens while he is standing to the fire. He falls asleep. Now the priest will make his rounds throughout the night at any hour, and he will find the priest who's supposed to tend to the altar. They will, he, will, he will find him sleeping. So what the priest will do, he will tend to the fire first, whether it need wood, whether it need cleaning, whether it need more, more meat on the altar, whatever it is. And he will tend to the fire first. And when he is finished tending to the fire, he will take a live coal. And he will put it on the priest that is sleeping. And that live coal will catch his clothes on fire. And when he wakes up, he will have to rip the burning clothes away from his body. And he will be running through the night naked. This is what it means like being a thief in the night. And this is where this idiom came from. Let's continue. Thou has a few names, even in Sardis, which has not defiled their garment. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Not defile their garment. They shall walk with me in white. So garment that is not defiled is usually white in color. Garment that is not defiled is usually white in color. And if you wear a white garment, you shall walk with him, Jesus, 
for you are worthy. Let's continue. Not defile garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Types of garments in the Bible, they talk about soft garments. They talk about colors like purple garments, fine linen, scarlet, wedding garment, priestly garments. So the Bible is full of garments. Now in Revelation, it talks about clothed with the sun, uh, with the cloud. That is the angel coming down, one foot on earth, one foot in the ocean. He was clothed with the, the cloud. Then you have the two witnesses, they were clothed with sackcloth. Then you have the, 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 the mystery, the woman with the 11 stars, she was clothed with the sun. The color of choice in the book of Revelation, Jesus had garment down to his foot, is white raiment. Uh, the elders in Revelation was wearing white raiments. The tribulation saints, white robes. The 144,000, white robes. The angels with the seven trumpets, pure and white linen. Uh, the army in heaven, fine linen, white and clean. Jesus had bestia dipped in blood. His clothes was white, but it was dipped in blood. So, so far we see that the choice of garment in the book of Revelation is white. Again, types of garment. James talk about your garments are not eaten. Eaten. Now, when your when your garment is is not eaten, you got holes all over your garment. Hating even garments spotted by the flesh. That is Jude twenty three. Garment that is not white is spotted by the flesh. Uh, Zechariah three three. Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. So really, we have two types of garments. We have filthy garments. We have on the, uh, defiled garments and undefiled garments. The Lord said un, unto Moses, go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. That's important. For the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people and washed their clothes. The people are sanctified when they wash their clothes. So you have garment that is spotted. You have filthy garments. You can wash your garments. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiments. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So three things are going to happen here. You will be clothed in white raiment. Like I told you, the, the color of choice in the book of Revelation is white raiment. He will not blot your name out of the book of life. And Jesus said, I will confess them before my father. Let us, let us look at that last one for a minute. In Luke chapter 12, verse 8, whosoever shall confess me before man, him shall the Son of Man confess before the angels of God. Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. Now, when Jesus talked about confessing your name before the Father, which is in heaven, he is talking about talking about your exploits, talking about the things that you did for him while you, while, while you were in ministry for the Lord. Now, I would like to deal with the second one. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. I have never seen in the Bible where Jesus or God or the Holy Spirit added people's name to the book of life. I have never seen that. If anybody could, could find that, I would like to know. But nobody's name were added to the book of life. So why or how would he blot our name out of the book of life? When was our name in the book of life? When does our name get into the book of life? The, the Hebrew rabbi, um, they said, have you noticed in the scripture when an angel come to announce uh, a birth of a baby, it's always a year. 
that that baby will be born from that day. It's always a year. So they say, how does that happen? So in the Jewish faith, they believe that the, the soul is dispatched from heaven. And it takes three months for the soul to climatize. Let me use that word. Climatize. Get used to being out of the presence of God and in the womb of a human being. Three months before that person will get pregnant. So is it possible that when that soul is dispatched, now I don't know, I am just telling you something to think about. Is it possible that when God dispatched that soul from heaven to a human being on earth, is it possible that that soul, uh, the name is written in the book of life at that point? So if, if that child is aborted, that, that, that soul is still under God. Is that possible? When, when does a person's name get into the book of life? Is it when they get saved? Then half of the people in the world, their name will not be in the book of life. But what Jesus is saying is, I could blot your name out of the book of life if you don't overcome. If you remain dead, if you don't strengthen the things that remain, I will blot your name out of the book of life. So is it possible that all of us are born with our name in the book of life? Remember the father said, um, it is his will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Is it because your name is at, all, at birth, your name is written in the book of life? Remember Psalm 23? Um, the Jewish people believe that the psalmist David, he remembered when his soul was making, it en it, making its entrance from heaven to his mother's womb. And he said, yea, do I walk through the valley of shadow of death. I will fear no evil for thou art with me. He is saying, or the Jewish people believe that that journey from heaven to his mother's womb, he was walking through the valley of shadow of death. This is, this is what the Jewish people believe. Is it possible that that's when his name was written in the book of life? I don't know. But your name can be erased from the book of life. Your name can be blotted out from the book of life. And Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, it says, and whosoever, and the books were opened. That is about two verses before. The books were open, open. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now let me go up to the first one. Clothed in white raiments. He that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said unto the churches. Now remember, remember the Lord, the Lord is writing to the church in Sardis. But he's talking to all the people. He that has an, had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying unto the churches. All the churches. Now, we were talking about raiments. But we are all as unclean things. And all our righteousness are as filthy rags. I put on righteousness and it clothes me. That is Job chapter 29. Let thy priest be clothed with righteousness and let the saints shout for joy. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord for he had clothed me with the garment of salvation and had covered me with the robe of righteousness. In the Bible, when it talks about clothing, garment, salvation, the robe of the robe of righteousness, which is the righteousness of Jesus Christ, because our righteousness are as filthy rags. We are not getting anywhere with our righteousness. We need Jesus' righteousness. That's how we will get to heaven. This is how we will be wearing white in, in heaven with Jesus Christ, because we put on his righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. Do you, do, you, do you remember blind Bithymius? Uh, what happened with him? When he heard Jesus call him, the first thing Bithymius did 
and you'll find that in Mark chapter 10, the first thing Bartimaeus did, he threw off his garment. He threw off his garment. What does that mean? In those days, in order to beg, you have to wear a particular type of garment that was assigned to you by the government. And when the people see you with that garment, they know that you are you 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 were sanctioned by the government to go ahead and beg for arms. When Bartimaeus, when he heard Jesus calling him, he threw off that garment and he wanted to start afresh. So tonight what we saw is that your garment could be moth eaten. It will have holes in it. Your garment could be spotted by the flesh or your garment could just be filthy. Or you can have undefiled garment and you will be wearing white and you will walk with Jesus because you are worthy to walk with him. So the garment that we are putting on, or the clothes that the priest was, what was clothed with was the righteousness. And we will be clothed, our garment will be salvation. And the robe that we will be wearing is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. This is what qualifies us to be in heaven with the Lord. So tonight, this is the end of the church in Sardis. And I hope you would uh, do your little reading assignment and you will learn a little more than what we did tonight. The time is thus short that we can't go into too much detail. But I want you to remember the unclean garment, the defiled garment, you put off that, you can wash your garment, you can be sanctified, and you put on the righteousness of Jesus, you put on the garment of salvation. So at this point, I would stop, and I'll turn back over to Pastor Michael. Thank you all for joining with me this evening.